health outcomes, changes due to interventions. To bring positive change, patient experiences and health must both improve. Healthcare costs must be lowered and clinician and staff burnout has to end. But our problems are big. 133 million Americans have at least one chronic disease. Half a million people are dying every year from hospital errors, injuries, and infection. The shortage of primary care professionals will be as much as 100,000 in just the next five years. Big problems require bigger solutions. Positive change needs acceleration. It needs to happen now. But these are not so easy solutions that many don't want to hear, and even few are willing to talk about. How to lead such a change? How to discover, discuss, and disrupt healthcare to make a difference now? This is Vitals, visionary health leadership in action. Good afternoon and welcome to Vitals. The acronym Vitals stands for Value, Innovation, Technology, Advocacy, Leadership, and Service. These are the tools that today's leaders use to advocate for change and make improvements in our healthcare system, solving some of the nation's biggest healthcare problems. Vitals is an open forum opportunity to have frank discussions with today's leaders who are implementing that change now, to learn from them, to advocate along with them, and to stimulate our own advocacy. Today, we are excited to be joined by Dr. Ed Barksdale, Jr., Surgeon in Chief at University Hospitals Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. Dr. Barksdale received his undergraduate degree from Yale University and his medical degree from Harvard Medical School, where he went on to train in general surgery at the prestigious Massachusetts General Hospital. He is currently the president of the American Pediatric Surgery Association, and he is a nationally recognized leader in pediatric surgery and a passionate advocate for children's healthcare. Well known outside the operating room for his extensive work in community service in child welfare, violence prevention, and health disparities. Serving as the Robert Isaac Jr. Professor of Surgery and Pediatrics at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, Dr. Barksdale launched a hospital-based violence intervention program for teens called the Anti-Fragility Initiative. The program aims to reduce recidivism, prevent adverse outcomes, and improve the patient's overall well-being. Of interest, Dr. Barksdale is more than just an accomplished surgeon, community leader, and family man. He is also an NCAA All-American fencer while at Yale University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ed Barksdale. Dr. Langell, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. I am absolutely delighted to join those of you in the virtual well, Dr. Langell, um, uh, Mr. Ingram, uh, Dr. Schmidt, this is a tremendous opportunity for us to have dialogue about what I feel is an important issue uh, as we face both health, healthcare, and all of medicine going forward, and that is, is leadership. I'd like to queue up uh, my slides. Let's see if I can go back and share my screen and uh, begin to chat a bit about about a few things that are important to me that I think that we are, uh, are in need of considering as we refashion healthcare going forward. You know, when, when I was asked to do this talk, I thought long and hard about what would be important uh, for me to share. And one of my major passions is leadership development, talent management. And um, whenever I talk about this, I worry a bit that I present myself as an expert or that I have expertise. But I would like to start my presentation with the humility of stating that I am, like most of us, a work in progress. And so many of the things that I may speak about, really, I'm working on. Wow, this has been an incredible 21 months. It's been mind-blowing. 
between the virus, the variant, the changes in the financial market, the racial reckoning that has occurred in this country, and the deep, deep political divisions that are working to tear the fabric and disrupt the tapestry of the great people that we are in this country. If there was a time for great leadership, that time I believe is now. And as we face this tremendous world of adversity, I look to many of the younger people in the audience and say to them that this is your crucible moment. This is, you are in the womb. This is a great opportunity. You know, as a young kid growing up in Lynchburg, Virginia, I read a lot. I fantasized a lot. I read biographies. And here are many pictures of the people that I admired in the past for their leadership and several of them are leaders that I admire. And as I thought about what I'd say to you today, I recognize that real leaders are not born. They are forged in crisis. And as you look at each of these people, they have come forward to rise because they stood up at a time where things were uncertain. And my grandmother, who I'll talk much about in this presentation, uh, was a fan of C.S. Lewis. And she would often talk about the role that hardship played in making people extraordinary in their pursuit of their own destiny. And so as I begin my next 17 minutes of presenting to you, I recognize that the ability to handle adversity is the most overlooked trait of every successful leader. And I hope in this period of time that I can do two things primarily. The first is that I hope that I can give you some brief vignettes of my own life, combined with certain didactic uh, theories on adversity and leadership, and that you will take these as a scaffold to build, intentionally build your own strategy or approach to dealing with adversity. And so my comments are weathering the storm, leadership during adversity. So if you look at Martin Luther King as the general of the civil rights movement of the 1960s, there are people like my parents and my sister shown on the screen who would be foot soldiers in his army. And 50 years ago at this month, my parents were deeply involved. And in fact, the picture in the far right corner was taken December 5th when lawyers from uh, New York, the Congress of Racial Equality snuck into my hometown to begin to, re to represent at another level the appeal my parents had to integrate the school system in my hometown of Lynchburg, Virginia. A historic moment, only the second integration in all of the state of Virginia. And I learned at an early age a lot about what adversity meant. The threats from African Americans from whites to destroy our homes, destroy our lives. But I watch my parents deal with that adversity, my sister deal with that adversity, and move on. As a child of the 60s, I was bathed in a cauldron of adversity that I would see as a voyeur from the television screen in my home or my grandmother's home. All of these events occurring that made no sense to the young boy looking out at the world uh, as, a, as I mentioned, a voyeur. But I didn't have to just deal with these by looking at them through TV. I lived them. I'm not sure if anyone can pick me out in the crowd. I think if you look closely, you'll see maybe I'm the one uh, to your right in the back screen. But um, this picture taken a year and a half after the integration suit my parents wanted, my sister and I to have a better life, uh, forced, us, it forced me into an environment where, although the children may have welcomed me, their parents didn't. And so it was tough for several years, but it was something that helped define me. And it, it helped me move forward to the point that I am now. And I, I many of these uh, kids are now adults and are friends, especially through Facebook. But I had a sentinel mo moment, and that occurred in about fourth or fifth grade when at show and tell, I proudly announced that I was going to be an astronaut when I grew up. This was the space age. Uh, and my teacher laughed. I was humiliated. 
And then when we went to the playground, uh, uh, several of the boys said uh, the N-word, don't become astronauts. And I was devastated. I ran away from school. I went home. My mother was upset. No one knew where I was. The police were looking. The school was upset. And I was sitting in my grandmother's living room where she often put me to teach me a lesson or to, to give me lessons. And there she is in the background there. I called her Baba. And so Baba set me down after this event and she gave me three lessons on adversity that have, have stayed with me my entire life. And uh, they are, the first is it's not what they call you, but what you answer to. And that applies in every leadership or role. It's not just around ethnicity or race. The second lesson that she said was that the worst thing is not to have a bad experience. The worst thing is to have that experience and not learn from it. Uh, she was prescient in many ways. But what she told me that uh, existed for so many years is that smooth seas don't make for strong sailors. Now, this is a woman who was born in 1886. Both of her parents were child slaves. She was fluent in German. Uh, she was college educated, the first social worker in our town. And she worked through uh, the pandemic of the 1900s and the depression. But this mantra of mine is how I think of adversity. Baba would talk about adversity as being passages. And passages, as you know, are those adverse or diverse experiences that we go through from time to time that may define us. You may call them adversity, but it's how we manage those high seas that become important. And she gave to me what she thought were the seven tools that I, the six tools that I needed, seven, I'm sorry, tools that I needed. And those you see uh, on the screen there. And I think that they may be Im implicit. I, I translated them into the way that I see them, but she told me the things on the left side. Very interesting for a woman who didn't swim, but often talked about the middle passage. And I think that there were relatives of hers who were brought over uh, during the time of slavery on boats. But these have become tools that I use to this day. And a couple that are really important, especially the final piece is that when you're in great distress, stay in the boat. How do you define adversity in the world that you live in, both personally and professionally? Is it swimming with sharks? Is it an unstable platform? Is it closed doors? Is it an unstable ladder to climb? Or is it uh, a, a, a glass ceiling that exists that you can't get through. Um, I think that we should define adversity as we see here as an event that can be sudden. We can't always put our arms around it. And at times it seems that we just can't break through. Um, but again, how we deal with this and how we become intentional in our approach is important particularly for those of us who are leaders and aspiring leaders. So we can deal with adversity and I think of adversity in our, the way we manage it through both per, in both our personal as well as our professional lives. Our, this adversity comes in three ways. It is inevitable. We know that we're gonna face tough seas. It is intense. It can challenge you, not just challenge you physically, but challenge your identity, as we're seeing now with the moral injury that has occurred with many of us in healthcare. But as we negotiated, uh, we gain insight and identity of how to move forward. And this is a bit complicated, and my slides will be available as a PDF if people want them. But adversity offers the leader the opportunity to learn if he or she can put a scaffold under the events and develop a sense of meaning. And again, it's not the, how the adversity occurs or what it is. These are events that have happened in my life. It's how you respond. It's not the event, how you respond. And so I think those are important. David Dodlick, who writes a lot about this, has given five important strategies for thinking about how we manage adversity uh, effectively as leaders. We first have to acknowledge it. We have to uh, 
reflect on what our role is, why it is occurring. We have to then put a framework around it and then integrate it in our, our lives and move forward. How do you handle adversity? Well, I, I think there are curious ways. I mean, there, there are some of us who take this attitude that we're gonna handle adversity by uh, running into the fire. Well, you know, as I look at that with the oxygen, I'm not sure that's always the best approach, but we as leaders have to face problems. Um, you know, some of us have this kind of maybe a uh, hard view that we grab the bull by the horns, this cowboy approach. Um, I used to have this approach, but I actually ended up much like this matador, uh, both injured and embarrassed by this approach of thinking that aggressive management of problems. We also have a tendency, or we may have a tendency to be chicken little, the sky is falling and catastrophize, or the Pollyanna type of approach in which we uh, just keep moving forward. And I think all of these strategies may have their place and you may use these, but I think that as I present more, you may think of um, other effective ways. The, the old way of thinking about leadership is thinking that leaders just keep moving forward. And I think that this belies what a leader needs to be for his or her people in times of duress. I like this concept and I've learned this concept from 14 years of leadership coaching <clears throat> that in order to be effective as a leader during times of duress, <clears throat> we often have to reframe the situation. And we must build upon our core values, who we are, uniquely who we are in the world and to ourselves and rely on those to help us move forward. My core values emanated from uh, my home and they are listed here. The spirituality is not just religion, but a sense of purpose. Family is not just nuclear or extended, it's a sense of community. Excellence is not just achievement, it's moral excellence and integrity. And social justice speaks for itself, it's about equity. These core values, I think, will help give you a growth mindset, as Carol Dweck talks about in her book, Mindset. And this growth mindset will allow you to develop a dynamic framework of learning that allows you to connect with people. And I believe, as Einstein says, that adversity introduces a person to him or herself because it increases their sense of self-awareness, which is two components. Self-awareness, as you know, is how we are or how well we know ourselves, but it is also an external uh, self-awareness and how well we understand how others see us. And developing this skill set through various tools, Johari window is one, allows us to identify blind spots and identify areas in which not only we can be better for ourselves, we can be better for others. So as I talk about adversity and my life experiences and the things I've stated, my first dealing with adversity was when I was an undergraduate at Yale University. And much like Michelle Obama, who I met when she was at Harvard Law School and I was doing my residency, I often felt um, that at times I was imp an imposter in that environment. For me, in the beginning, Yale was like hitting a curveball. And those of you who uh, enjoy baseball understand that a curveball is hard to hit. And I'm like Charlie Brown. There were many times I was swinging and swinging and missing. And then with reflection, I came to understand how you hit a curveball, how you deal with adversity. Well, study is one, training, practice, identifying what levels of adversity that you can make contact with and be uh, and, and, and do well. And coaching and advice from others, feedback is critical. And then the secret I've learned only after leaving Yale, the secret to hitting the curveball is that sometimes you got to let the good ones go because if you swing at a good curveball, it'll be a grounder that, that gets, um, gets you out. I was fortunate, I was an All-American fencer, fourth in the country, and my coach, I learned a lot about the role that coaching does to help you achieve excellence. There are a variety of strategies for 
uh, leadership uh, in adversity. And I've listed them here and I won't go through them in much detail. I'll talk about a couple. Reflective leadership, which as you see here, adversity strikes, and we reflect on it and we build our own capacity to respond and to be resilient, to get back to where we were before. And uh, ultimately we act and then we move in the transformation phase. And again, I think this ability to respond to adversity, particularly for those of us in healthcare, our goal as physician, physician leaders, healthcare leaders is to have impact in the world. Lots is written about resilience and I don't like this term very much because I think resilience, this concept of bouncing back is fallacy. We're not really gonna bounce back to the way we were after this pandemic. And I think this uh, approach to resilience may be a bit Pollyannish. The term that I've come to love and be enamored with for the last 16 or 17 years is a term by Nassim Tlaib, an NYU business professor, which is called anti-fragility. And it is built on the concept that when businesses uh, become disordered and then reordered again, they gain strength from that. You know the deal, uh, a goblet, you drop it, you break it, it's fragile, it can't be put back together. A sword that's steel, you try to bend it, you can't. Uh, that is uh, the essence of what we want to be, but there's nothing in our life that is truly that robust. Anti-fragile is DNA. You break it, it comes back together and it benefits from disorder. And as he mentions here that um, anti-fragility is about getting better. And anti-fragile leaders are described there. They lead with humanity. They listen well. They democratize their environment. They manage adversity in a way that brings others in and allows the environment to move forward. And uh, we all recognize in adversity that it breaks everyone, but it's getting stronger in those broken places that is important. Another strategy, transformative resilience. Uh, this is a little bit of the bounce back, but as my father would often tell me in life, when you fail, you must fail forward. This is bounce forward. And I think this is discussed really well in this book by Emma Marston and her mother, Stephanie Marston, that talks about transformative resilience. And it lists these traits uh, that are important in developing transformative resilience. And they are not linear, they are matrix and can be developed asymmetrically as you see here. And they give you a nice story of Massimo Boturo, uh, this famous chef in Italy who had only one piece of uh, his world famous pie left and uh, his sous chef dropped and broke it uh, before uh, they could deliver it to one of his most famous customers. And so what did he do? He uh, told the customer, this is the new thing. And he named the dessert, oops, I dropped the lemon tart. And so this is a way of pivoting. This is a way of, of being uh, a resilient leader, one in which you have a healthy relationship with control, you're dynamically learning, you have a strong sense of your true north and you build sustainable networks and you remain actively engaged. And I've emphasized this enough, but I think these are the types of ways that we need to think about uh, leading. Quickly, as I close, so I talked about my first uh, lesson in adversity, uh, moving from Lynchburg, Virginia to Yale. My next major step was my first job as assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, where I was on the tenure track, I made tenure, but I found all of these potential obstacles, a lack of sponsorship, a heavy, what's called a black tax, a demand for minority faculty to serve on tons of committees. And what I learned in dealing with adversity there is detailed in the bullet points that I've listed for you. Adaptability occurs over and over again. Avoiding frustration, which is a killer and recognizing the importance of the collective, building your network outside of your environment, and also choosing your colleagues and friends carefully, the importance of mentorship as distinct from the importance of sponsorship, and also 
beginning a process of self-directed learning leader as a leader. And so as I've recognized, it is not, you know, as someone who was fortunate enough to, to train and to go to university with really brilliant people, I've recognized that the most successful people I know have adopted some of this Darwinism that they have been able to be malleable and change in their environment. Finally, my, my most recent step of being surgeon in chief uh, has probably been the most challenging uh, adaptive experience of my career. Lots of different things that I needed to negotiate. And what I learned is that the map is not the territory. So how what you're told you may get when you're recruited is not the same. That how high, the higher up you go as a leader, the air gets very thin. It continues to be important that we build networks and that we get external feedback from others to, to help us craft our own institution. This concept that we're gonna change the environment on our own and that we have the right idea is not uh, so good. I have come to rely heavily on coaching as, as well as formal leadership training and education and the recognition that humility and hope guides the world. So uh, as I, I, I move toward closing, I, I, I look at this image and still think at times I need to be this person as a leader, always running to the fire. But as I've led, I've recognized that in these settings, you have to take care of yourself first, you have to be intentional, and that will allow you to lead others. So I've talked about uh, how we de deal with adversity as individuals and how it builds our capacity, our capability to lead others. At the end of the day, you know who the leader is here. The leader is the hands that are dirty, helping someone else. And in these times that we're dealing with uh, changes in finances and healthcare, the virus and all types of things, we often aspire to leadership to be in the vitality zone, but this restoration zone has, uh, has grown tremendously. And so in order for us to do well in that environment, we need to create a culture that has a flat hierarchy. We need to be purpose or value driven. We need to cultivate a work family environment. We need to empower all of those around us, this democratization of our environment. And we must tell stories, the stories that are anchors of who we are, the stories that are anchors of, of who we want to be, that create meaning and enthusiasm and an ethos of, of positivity. What I'm saying is we must be purveyors of hope. So I close by telling you, this is the Barksdale approach to, to adversity, separation, finding a hobby, something that gets you away. Uh, I wish I could go fishing. I like to get out into nature, uh, reflection. I keep a journal. I, I think often about how things are. When things are tough, I want to go deep. I want to submerge myself or uh, away so that I can really think about what's going on. And then I own it. And then I think about what the action steps are and those action steps that help me evolve as a leader. And much as Alvin Toffler, uh, a futurist says that it's the education of ourselves that, it's, that is important as leaders. Um, the, the great people of the 21st century will be those who are not bright, but those not who are bright in what they create, but those who are able to be uh, adaptable by learning, unlearning and relearning. And so um, I finally close by saying it's a lot about evolution. We celebrate leadership because we see the great things that leaders do. We don't talk about their failures, but in reality, uh, the great leaders are like this monarch butterfly. They must go through difficult times. They must enter a cocoon before they can emerge to be these great change makers. And so as I close to today, I, I challenge you, I hope I can have inspired you to think about adversity and how you will intentionally deal with that. I appreciate the opportunity to go over a little bit in time uh, to speak with you about what I feel is a very important component in our development as leaders.
I'd like to pass, uh, if you will, the mic over virtually uh, to uh, Ms. Betty Lynn Fisher, who you all well know is the medical reporter and consumer columnist for the Akron Beacon Journal. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barksdale. Uh, you provided so much information that is uh, so good and, and, and a lot for us to think about. Um, before we um, uh, get started on some questions and answers, uh, there is a uh, there is a question and answer box. If uh, you as a participant have a question that you'd like to ask Dr. Barksdale, please type it in there and I will try to get to as many as I can. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that um, I am a fill-in. I know that normally uh, my friend and uh, senior health uh, correspondent Monica um, Robbins uh, from WKYC is normally the moderator here. Um, and so uh, I've been asked to fill in for her um, as she uh, is going undergoing um, her second brain surgery here soon. So we do certainly uh, keep our thoughts and prayers uh, for Monica and uh, got some big shoes to fill here. So um, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Mark Stahl, I'm gonna ask you a couple questions on my own. I'm a journalist, so you probably would expect that I would ask you a couple of questions. Um, you know, um, early on in your, in your talk, you were talking about uh, the, um, you know, some of the challenges that you faced and that, you know, you wanted to be an astronaut at first right. and that, you know, you were told you couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and instead you became a physician, <laughs> a leading physician. So I'd like, I'd like to hear uh, a little bit of background about, you know, how did you, how did you make that decision and what kind of reaction did you get when you told people, okay, well, I'm going to be a doctor. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the interesting things that my grandmother told me, those are the three big lessons. She said, don't tell everyone your dream because some people will step on your dream. And uh, the, the interesting thing, I'm from a very small town. <laughs> and so um, one of my friends became one of the first black astronauts. <laughs> and so it's just uh, ironic. So the, uh, I was very lucky. I grew up with a uh, strong nuclear family. Mother and father were only married 63 years. My grandmother lived to be 90 next door. And so, it's almost like this uh, movie, The Help, and it, it's a bit corny, but every day my grandmother would tell me, you are smart, you are good looking, and you can change the world. And I'm none of those things. But when you tell a child that from a very early age, you saw the picture of me at, at three years of age, I came to believe that. So there, I, you know, I lost an interest, interest in being an astronaut, but I wanted to become a scientist. And I had a lab, a funded lab in Pittsburgh. We did tumor vaccine design and I wanted to be a surgeon. And so I was able to, to do those things, but I was able to hold them to myself and find people who would support that. And so I think the message is you want to find um, colleagues, you want to find superiors, mentors, and sponsors who can support that dream and not necessarily be discouraged by those people who don't believe the things you believe. When you were at Yale and then also at Harvard, um, you know, being a, a, a trained, uh, you know, a, a student and then a medical student who was black, did you, you know, can you talk a little bit about the adversity that you faced there? And, and you know, were you, um, you know, were you a minority among the, you know, your, your colleagues? So um, when I went to Yale, I was really scared. Um, I mean, my, my mother was a seamstress in a sock factory. She never finished high school. She finished the 10th grade. My father only finished high school. And uh, I would sound like the worst name dropper to tell you who I lived with, who my roommates were, um, and, and what was done in my room. But I've started by telling you that one of my roommates, who was Asian American, president of the Asian American Students, uh, had this shy young Asian woman come build this black thing in our room. She was an architecture major and it really didn't make sense to what it is, but Maya Lin ultimately won. <laughs> and is uh, so I knew her uh, every Sunday night uh, because they were concerned that African-Americans would uh, leave Yale. This was the first generation. My last name is Barksdale. So there's a, a B-A-R, uh, me, uh, a B U R, and there was this woman with a last name B A S who wanted to be an actress, and we didn't think that Angela Bassett would ever be an actress. And so my my point is that there were enough people around who were dreamers, and I resonate, and and enough people to cultivate that dream. So I didn't think a lot about being a minority at Yale. I was too scared, 
And when I got to Harvard Medical School, um, I, I didn't think as much about being a minority. It was a fairly progressive environment. People leaned in. Um, I just thought about trying to be the best that I could in that environment. I think more about being a minority uh, since I've finished residency and, and training, uh, because as I mentioned in one of the slides, as you get further to the top, the air gets thinner. And I have found that there are fewer people who are willing to help. So anyway, I, I think that what I would advise for everyone, uh, if you're an ethnic minority, if you're LGBTQ, uh, if you're short, if you're tall, if you are whatever, we all have something that makes us stand out. It's cultivating our, the strength of our identity uh, and our purpose that allows us to move forward. Great. Um, and we all know who Angela Bassett is, but I will say Maya Lin, if I'm correct, is the architect and designer of the Vietnam Memorial uh, she, in Washington, D.C. Yes, yes, she is. She's very, shy. she's very shy. And if you met her, you would never know because she's very self-effacing. Yeah. Great. Um, let's go to a couple questions that have been asked. So Elaine asks, you mentioned the black tax. Please give a couple of examples of what that means and ways that younger black leaders coming up can navigate around or through it based on your experience. So the, the term the black tax is something that many people have coined in my generation who are the first to be there. So there are 1500 pediatric surgeons in the United States. I'm the fifth trained. Um, when I trained in, in, in surgery at the Mass General Hospital, a prestigious place, I was the first ever in the 165 year history. And so then every committee that people are looking for diversity, the Dean of the medical school, wants an African-American on the admissions committee. The hospital wants someone on the diversity committee. And then what happens is, if those of us who are academics, our time is eaten up by us trying to be good doobies. And so how do you negotiate that? Uh, I think it was very tough for me coming along because you didn't want to say no. You didn't want anyone to think you're negative. In these, this era, it is so critical for leaders early on to find sponsors. You know, a, a leader, a, a, a mentor advises, but a sponsor makes a way in the jungle and that sponsor can protect you from those things. So I would encourage people to look to cultivate relationships with both mentors, but more importantly, sponsors. And there's a woman, Sylvia Civil, Ann Hewitt, who's written a, a great book about that. It's called Find a Mentor. I'm sorry, Find a Sponsor, Forget a Mentor. Um, you know, much has been, uh, you know, talked about that racism is a public health issue um, these days. And, and, you know, we all certainly know that a spotlight has been um, brought on that, uh, you know, health access to health care for the black community, especially, um, is, is difficult. Do you feel an extra sense of responsibility or an extra burden being a black physician? Or how important is it for you, for your patients to see somebody that looks like them? Yeah. So do I feel a responsibility? Absolutely. Um, I didn't get, so when I give talks uh, about similar things, I show a picture of a turtle on a fence post. And you know that image, right? Or if you think of that image, how did that turtle get there? He or she didn't get there on their own. And so I start my talk paying homage to my family not because they're my family, but my sister, my parents who are deceased are symbolic of the struggles of people who did not have this opportunity to be on vitals or to be invited uh, to, to do things. So I feel a responsibility. Uh, but I, I feel a responsibility to underserved and under-resourced people across the country. When I was in Pittsburgh, I developed a program that went deep into Appalachia uh, to provide care for children who were abandoned, their parents had left them. We won a national award. We were in 2020 uh, when Rosie O'Donnell came out for the work that we did. So I, I, I am someone who has a passion for the underserved, the, the under-resourced. And in many ways, what brought me to Cleveland um, is to, um, to, to, to provide for the least and the lost and the left behind, which was another mantra of my grandmother that, you know, you can't take your talents with you. You got to die empty. Uh, and that is, you got to give away those things. So yes, so I feel that responsibility. 
Okay, great. Along those lines, Andre asks, um, first of all, says, great message, Dr. Barksdale. Thank you. Speaking on leadership, I recently read that you were appointed to Cleveland Mayor-elect Justin Bibb's Transition Healthcare Subcommittee that will assist the mayor-elect with developing priorities for his first 100 days in office. Cleveland, like most areas, suffer from healthcare disparities. What do you feel is a top priority besides COVID for Cleveland and Northeast Ohio? I have three top priorities. Uh, and in the transition team that I, I was asked to serve on several, I chose. Those three are violence, violence, and violence. Um, the major, in my opinion, the major healthcare problem in Northeast Ohio, if not America's healthcare. And when you think of violence, you think of the direct violence. I think of the structural violence, the, the, the violence that constrains opportunity for people to get access to care, the, the violence that leads to unsafe neighborhoods. So young girls don't walk and they become morbidly obese and the stress that people feel that they may be, be shot. And so it's called allostatic load, uh, which raises their blood pressure and then the adverse childhood experiences. So I think that we have to um, attack the lived environment in Cleveland and look at ways of making Cleveland safer so that that safety will be the foundation for health. And so that's why I'm working with public safety I'm working with the, I helped write the consent decree for Tamir Rice after Tamir Rice was shot. I helped, I was on the committee that helped write the consent decree. I never thought I'd be working in the realm of, of violence, but I see violence as a health issue. And um, that's, you know, the approach that we take. Okay. I have a question from a medical student. Uh, what strategies would you advise medical students to utilize to quote, avoid frustration? Yeah, uh, I advise them to, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I don't have a good answer for this because I have a son who's a medical student and I have another son who's about to become a medical student. And they tell me that I have old world um, baby boomer um, advice. And so I have to defer to my children who think I'm an old timer, but I think that the best way to avoid frustration uh, the two ways is the, the first is the same way you get to Carnegie Hall. Uh, the, how do you get to Carnegie Hall in New York City? You practice, you, you train. Um, but the other part that I feel that's so important and was very important to me at Harvard Medical School, um, you know, my best friend is the dean of the University of Miami School of Medicine, who's my best friend since we were at a program for underprivileged kids in New York. Harvard Medical School partners in Pittsburgh, is that we built a sense of common unity. And so I wanna introduce that term to the students. So a community is a group of people who live or work together. Uh, my grandmother would call our neighborhood common unity as distinct from community. And she would say that common unity is a place where you can be for others and others can be for you. That distinguishes it. And so when I was in medical school, my friend Henri Ford heads the Haitian relief effort, a tremendous person, talent, people who know him nationally, he's, is that he would stay up all night, the night before a big exam at Harvard Medical School to walk one of our other colleagues who was struggling through. So he would give up the honors that he could get in order to keep our friend from failing. And so that is noble. And, and if you look at his achievements, I think, you know, as my grandmother would say, you don't shine a light on someone else's path without shining it on your own. And so I would encourage medical students to lean in, to build that sense of common unity. I'd advise them to find mentors who are around and then to look for, for sponsors. But I would also say that there's no substitute for hard work and, and recognizing if you learn strategies to deal with adversity and failure, you can fail forward instead of failing backwards, which is detrimental. Another question from uh, someone asking, how can aspiring physicians become leaders in the health systems they serve? Well, I, I think that um, it, it takes several things. One is showing up, showing up on time, uh, doing what you have been assigned to do. The concept of trust is so important. And, and what I mean by trust, it's not that you're not telling the truth, 
but when people give you a task that you deliver on that task, I think that's important. And the final piece I continue to go back to is sponsorship. Um, my greatest sponsor in my career has not been a physician. Um, it has been a hospital administrator who lives in Chicago now, who I met relatively uh, late in my career. And the ability to get honest, critical feedback is so important, I think, as we're developing as leaders. Uh, that segues into another question, which is who do you currently admire as healthcare leaders, both nationally, internationally, and why? So you answered a little bit of that, but if you want to expand on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, one of them is um, one of them is going to be a little bit selfish. And so I, I'm going to Say so. The person I really admire is a woman by the name of Ayla Stanford, Doctor Ayla, um, Black Doctors Consortium. She's vaccinated more people in Philadelphia than than the Philadelphia city. She's one of the ten people who is up for CNN Hero. She won the George Bush Award with Brian Stevenson this year. She's absolutely phenomenal. She's a dynamo. I admire her. I love her and I mentor and sponsor and coach her for the last 20 years. And so we have worked on this. I'm a social justice person. So we've trained a number of people in this concept of leadership, in this concept of advocacy, activism, and leadership. And so that's where I, even though I'm a scientist at heart, you know, I, I think that the, the doctors of the future are gonna have to be able to move from the laboratory to the bedside, um, to the clinic, to the boardroom, and to the community. Because what we need to train nurses, physicians, leaders, and all of healthcare is, is how to have an impact. So Ayla Stanford, and uh, if people think about looking her up on CNN and reading about her and they feel inclined to vote for her, uh, they can. Henri Ford, uh, my best friend. Uh, we were two boys, he's from Haiti, I'm from Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, when we were 17 at a program for underprivileged kids in New York City, we vowed to each other that one day we'd try to change the world. He's done it. I am in his, in his wake. And so um, that's who I admire. There are people who are gonna be on. So Zeke Emanuel, I think is gonna be speaking. I knew Zeke at Harvard Medical School. I admire some of the work that he's, he's done to improve access. But I can tell you, there are nameless physicians and nurses that I work with every day who I have immense admiration for because they work in the trenches. They get no recognition. I want to be them. Uh, I want to have both hope and humility, uh, as I mentioned, to, to kind of do the things that matter. I think you're being a little humble there too, but... Uh... About yourself. Um, another question, how can leaders address racism, homophobia, and other forms of oppression that are supported by policies and procedures of certain health organizations? Yeah, I think we need to lean in and, and talk. Um, my, my father, who I'm pointing to on the wall, was vice mayor of my hometown, and he would say, and, and my hometown was the home of moral majority. And well, there was so much I didn't tell you. The biggest opposition to my parents in the 1960s was a young minister by the name of Jerry Falwell, who said my parents should never expect that either their children would be anything more than they were. But my father would respond to that by saying, there are people who see the world like you and, and who don't see the world the way you do. Not all the people who don't see the world the way you do are bad or en enemies. We must listen. We must have dialogue and, and we must commit that if we're going to build a better community, not common unity, that we have to commit. Um, otherwise, um, the fabric is going to be torn and our society changes. And again, I keep getting back to, and the reason I chose to talk about adversity and leadership and not some of our social justice work, because I think this is what's driving our country apart. We, we need bright young minds and, 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 and strong hands and hearts to think about people who have different views, have those skills, how to come together to create solutions for our country, if, if not our world. 
And speaking of adversity, can you clarify for me if adversity is the same as failure or is it another way of saying how you deal with failure? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I love that. So um, it, I think it's a little bit more than, than uh, or, or a little bit different than that. You know, when, when I think of adversity, I, I think of it as the experiences that are inevitable, that are diverse and, and different. And it's how you manage them it's to whether they become failure or not. So some of the adversity that you have in your life is you get promoted to be the editor of uh, the Akron Beacon Journal. You may love that, but that may have create more stress in your family life or on you. And so um, adversity can be a dual edged sword. Failure uh, in my mind can be adversity, but Adversity covers many more life events, many more domains that can, can occur. Failure is a part of adversity, but I don't think they're, they are the same, same things. Thanks for the vote of confidence. I don't want to be the editor of the Beacon Journal. <laughs> happy, happy doing what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have uh, someone pointing out an interesting, uh, interesting parallel. So it's interesting that you wanted to be an astronaut, but emerged as a surgeon. Yeah. Neomed President Dr. John Langle was also apparently an aspiring astronaut who became a surgeon instead. Right. Are there parallels between these fields? Well, I think if you you look at at uh, Dr. Langell on the on the screen, I mean, he's so much younger than I am. He's about twenty years younger than I am. So it was a, a real dream. It wasn't for me, but I think there are intense parallels in my mind. What I wanted to be when I was that age is I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, I was interested in a broad range of sciences, and in the nineteen sixties, uh, the astronauts were science scientists, and I thought this was uh, great. I wasn't really interested in medicine at, at that age, but, um, and it's been written about, I had the opportunity to meet Martin Luther King that spring after my parents in, um, integrated the school system. And when I met him, I didn't know who he was. He was like every other in that time, Negro preacher. He was not very tall. He spoke with his hands. Um, he paused a lot when he spoke. Those are the things I remember as a kid. And he had no halo and he had no wings. He was just an ordinary person. And then five or six years later, I realized who I had met. Uh, I knew my mother was excited meeting him. And so what I recognize is that we have, those of us who are ordinary people have the opportunity to create extraordinary destinies for other people if we use the talents that we have our iron will, and that if we can deal with adversity, that it doesn't derail us in, the, in our effort. So um, yeah, I, uh, I wanted to be an astronaut because I love science and uh, it seemed like smart people, astronauts were smart people. Okay, uh, I've got another question that uh, is a little shout out as well, hail to Pitt. Both of my children were born at, um, probably gonna say this wrong, Maggie Hos Women's Hospital. McGee. McGee. Like, uh -huh. McGee Women's Hospital in Pittsburgh, UPMC provides great healthcare. Can you share how to quickly understand and interpret the culture at organizations that do things right and how to incorporate those positive things in your daily life? Um, I would have to say to that anonymous attendee, that would have to be an offline answer because I would want to preserve my employment. But I, I can tell you they're distinctly different cultures in organizations. And, and my biggest challenge, um, uh, as a leader has been uh, adapting to different culture. There's a saying in healthcare, if you've been in one academic medical center, you've been in one academic medical center. And uh, so I've trained in several major ones, the Mass General, uh, UPMC, Cincinnati Children's, uh, and, and now here. I think it's so important for organizations to establish a strong culture of who they are, an identity, of, of its people and then a strong vision of where they're going. And I think that not every hospital can fill every role within a community, but having that strong sense of your identity and your mission and, and making sure that vertically and horizontally people embrace that. Another question is, though a successful pediatric surgeon, do you, do you find yourself still having to prove yourself in certain circles? And did it at first surprise you? Um, so that's a great question. I don't find that I have to prove myself in the clinical circles of being a, a surgeon. There, um, 
we've done some innovative things. Uh, we we started some first in the world program. We ran the largest things in the world of pediatric surgery. I have uh, enough of a reputation. I'm not com uncomfortable. I've had situations here in Cleveland where people have gone to other places and in other places, they said that they send their patients to me. And so patients come back sheepishly. I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not an ego driven person in that regard. I have felt though that I had to prove myself as a leader. That has been a bit, honestly, that's been a bit of a struggle. And uh, I've, I've felt more challenges in that regard in this environment than I ever felt in any other environment or in, than I feel nationally in my national leadership roles. But uh, that's probably me. And uh, I have to be more malleable, adaptable uh, in order to, to recognize the culture and, and how to be a better cultural fit. I would just add to the people on the line that when you are students or young people, when you're looking to change jobs or move cultures, there's a concept that people look for that they call cultural fit. Don't take a job in which you are a cultural fit. Uh, look for a job where they want you to be a cultural ad uh, because a cultural fit is gonna look to put you in a mold that you may not be because they don't know from a, hours of interviews, they don't know who you are. The, the ultimate respect is when an organization or culture is inviting you for what you bring uniquely to embellish their organization. And um, I'm not sure um, that happens in, in every place. I certainly can say that at UPMC and at Pitt, I felt that I was recruited as a cultural ad. Okay. We are closing in on the one o'clock hour here. So if anybody's got a last minute question you'd like to uh, throw in the uh, questions, go ahead and I'll try to get to it. Uh, let, me, let me ask you this one. As a leader in academia, a healthcare system and in the community, how would you grade our current strategies for weathering the storms of COVID, violence, healthcare access, structural racism, physician healthcare provider burnout, medical profession attrition, and the rising costs of education? We are becoming strong sailors. Smooth seas don't make for strong sailors. And we're going through passages and we're hitting some tough times. There's a picture that I showed you, uh, which is, uh, the Sea of Galilee, which is storm on the Sea of Galilee, which is by Rembrandt. And, and that picture is uh, the only Rembrandt that he did that didn't have a person in, and it has this rocky seas. And so when I went to Harvard Medical School, that was at the Isabella Gardner Museum, which is right down from Harvard, and it was stolen about 20 years ago. It's more. But the important part of that picture is that if you get a chance to look at it and read about it, is that it's on a stormy sea, I think that how we keep our focus, where we put our focus, where our values are, will help us get through. I think Northeast Ohio is a rich place with rich opportunities, with great people like you and Dr. Langell, um, uh, Dr. Schmidt I, and Dr. Boutros and and uh, there and, and McGarry. And I think that we are well poised in a tough area to move forward effectively. We just have to lean in and build that common unity across all the domains that separate us. Well, great. Thank you, Dr. Boxdale, for a, a very inspiring talk and, and a, a, um, a nice inform, you know, back and forth. We really appreciate uh, you uh, taking these questions. I'm going to send it back to Dr. Langle to um, uh, close us out. Thank you, Betty. And Betty, thank you for that expert moderation. Dr. Barksdale, thank you for a thought-provoking and enlightening conversation. There were many lessons for all of us to learn uh, from your example. We are very fortunate to have such a great healthcare leader here as part of our community in Northeast Ohio. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to please join us next month for Vitals when we'll hear from Dr. Scott Kenor the executive vice president and the chief executive officer of the American Pharmacists Association. Until then, stay safe, stay well, and please engage and use the tools of vitals to become advocates in your community to invoke change. Health outcomes, changes due to interventions, to bring positive change, patient experiences and health must both improve. Healthcare costs must be lowered.
and clinician and staff burnout has to end. But our problems are big. 133 million Americans have at least one chronic disease. Half a million people are dying every year from hospital errors, injuries, and infection. The shortage of primary care professionals will be as much as 100,000 in just the next five years. Big problems require bigger solutions. Positive change needs acceleration. It needs to happen now. But these are not so easy solutions that many don't want to hear, and even few are willing to talk about. How to lead such a change? How to discover, discuss, and disrupt healthcare to make a difference now? This is Vitals, visionary health leadership in action.